Hello everyone and welcome back to another Stratagoy video. We're back finally with some Lumineth Tactica guides. The first one we're going to tackle um, for the new book is the Light of Altharion. I chose to start with um, our beautiful armor boy. Well, for several reasons actually. First of all, he's a named hero that I didn't cover yet, so it, it's, it's a good addition to the series that we already have. And he's somewhat independent of JHB changes, so I could go ahead and make this video without knowing the full scope that the JHB would have uh, later on. So let's dive right in. Now with our new series of guides, I'm also introducing a new kind of slide here, and it's a video question. So for this uh, video around, I'm asking you guys this question. Should the Light of Eltharion have some magic? Some of you guys might wonder why I would ask this question and well, if you've played Warhammer Fantasy and you recognize the image on the left, you know why. Um, back in the day, in the Warhammer Fantasy days, the Light of Eltharion was a... Uh, well, was not the Light of Eltharion, he was just Eltharion the Grim on his griffin and he had the um, Hoeth uh, Talisman, which allowed him to cast two spells, which was uh, pretty good in the day. Most wizards in the High Elf roster had two or even three spells, so it wasn't amazing. Uh, but I would I would have thought that it would be cool for GW to at least give the Light of Eltharion one cast or maybe a, an item um, that he can use to cast a spell. But that's just my opinion, so please do let me know what you guys think. Do you think he should have any magic at all or do you feel like he's good as he is? Also, please like and subscribe if you're enjoying the content so far and if you like this video especially. Um, do leave a like or leave a comment what you want to see next. This video has been um, mostly built up um, around the suggestions from the community in the Discord, so if you want to hang around there or have a chat with some very exper experienced um, LRL, LRL players, uh, please do come and take a look. Okay, so as per usual, the summary, uh, first of all we're going to take a look at the war scroll, then we'll look at what his role is in the army, we'll talk some basic tactics afterwards and to finish it off we're going to uh, look at some tips and tricks. So first of all let's start off with the war scroll here. Um, if we're looking at his basic profile in the corner there, uh, you can see he has 8 wounds, a move of 6, a save of 3+, plus, and a bravery of 10. Now the bravery of, of 10 is pretty big. Um, because it will allow him to use Heroic Recovery uh, more easily, which we'll get into later on. Uh, wounds of 8 is pretty nice. You could somewhat double it because he has a special rule that we'll talk about in a moment, where he um, halves his incoming damage rounding up. Uh, it's not obviously not completely double, it's not like a 4 plus ward save or anything, but it's still pretty good. Um, his move of 6 is just standard and his 3 plus save might appear to be kind of weak for us a hero, especially a hero that's that pricey, um, but he does have some abilities that protect him in the long run. The really impressive stuff though is his weapon profiles and they are impressive even without the special rules that we'll see later on. So his Fang Sword of Eltharion is, is an amazing weapon, especially if you're a Lumineth uh, only player you don't see any of these profiles anywhere else. So uh, it's only a range of one, but he has four attacks, hits on a two, wounds on a three, minus three rent, which is amazing, and three damage, which is also pretty good. His Solanari Blade is a little bit weaker, um, but only in the sense that it has less attacks and uh, less rent, but the damage is still the same, and the hit and wound is also the same. So that's also a strong weapon. Now, why are we paying close to 200, 250 points for this guy? Well, mostly because of his abilities. Both of his swords have different abilities. He also has a uh, special sort of ranged attack, I would, I would say. It's not really a missile weapon, but it's still a ranged attack. Um, he also has a really good arm that protects him from incoming damage, and he's an excellent swordsman. Starting off with a Selenari Blade, at the start of the combat phase you can pick one monster or hero within 3 inches of this unit. If you do so, attacks made with the, this unit's Selenari Blade versus that hero or monster have a damage characteristic of 2d3 rather than just flat out 3. So in most cases this is an upgrade. Uh, as in, in 8 out of 9 cases this is an upgrade. If, you, uh, if you're, if you're interesting, interested in knowing the maths, I will refer to, to, uh, you to Ryan, <laughs> who's our uh, 
res residential mathematical expert here. You can contact him, him in the comments here or in the Discord, or you can go watch his Math Hammer series. Uh, one of the first videos we did, we did with for the Math Hammer series was actually about comparing the 2D3 to other things. So out of the nine rolls you could make with uh, 2D3, uh, eight out of uh, nine times is going to be um, just as good as, as three damage or even better. So that's pretty good. Uh, usually you're taking this upgrade unless you only need to do that specific uh, three damage then maybe it's not better. Uh, but uh, in all the other cases, I would definitely take it. Um, all right, so for the Fang Sword, um, that is a bit more impressive. You add one to wound rolls for attacks made with this unit's Fang Sword if this unit made a charge move in the same turn. So that means he's going from a 3-2 wound to a 2-2 two, two wound. So 2 to hit and 2-2 two, two wound on the charge, which is pretty juicy. <laughs> um, in addition, if the unmodified hit roll for an attack with a Fang Sword is 6, that attack causes one mortal wound in addition to any normal damage. He only has four attacks on the Fang Sword, so that's only ever going to be an extra four mortal wounds, which is still pretty nice, especially since it's in addition. If you add the two to hit, two to wound, minus three rent and three damage on top of that damage characteristic, as well as his Supreme Swordsman Master ability, which we'll get into in a moment, things are going to get, uh, well, things are going to die, <laughs> mostly, most of the time. Um, so yeah, he's pretty reliable in the damage compartment. His ability that I like the most, actually, which you uh, might find weird, especially if you're prone to rolling a lot of ones, is his shooting ability. Uh, it's not a missile weapon, once again, uh, but uh, it is um, triggered in your shooting phase. You can pick one enemy unit within 18 inches of this unit, and that is visible to it. And roll a dice. This is somewhat like the um, Searing White, White Light Storm from Teclas. On a 1, nothing happens. On a 2 to 4, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds, and on a 5 to 6, that unit suffers d6 mortal wounds. I really like this ability for several reasons. Uh, we'll get into those um, throughout the entire video actually. Um, but one of the reasons that I'm not going to get into any further but I will mention right now is because of the lore aspect of it. Not only is it super cool to just think that he's shooting, I don't know, a Cyclops beams or maybe beams out of his fingers, um, but I, I like that it's somewhat the same as Teclas' ability, especially since it was Teclas who kind of rebuilt this guy, right? He uh, caught his soul uh, from Slanesh and he bound him into this arm because he would all, always crumble again. So he only was able to capture his essence into an empty armored shell. So it's kind of cool that the magic that is holding him together uh, came from Teclas and he can also use that same magic to uh, unleash some uh, damage just like Teclas would, but he does it in an AoE, which is even better, of course. All right, uh, moving on to the Spirit Armor. This is where uh, he gets his tankiness from and where he gets the reputation that he's sort of a mini Gotrek, I suppose. Um, you ignore modifiers, both negative and positive, which is quite uh, impactful here, when making save rolls for attacks that target this unit. In addition, Half the uh, damage inflicted by attacks made with missile and melee weapons rounding up. So what does this mean? Well, first of all, you don't ever need to spend an ethereal spell on this guy because he's always ethereal. You also don't need to use um, a lot of fence on this guy because it would not work. It doesn't matter. He'll always be in a 3 plus save. There is no way to redu reduce it um, against attacks at least. Now in some um, rare cases you can still manipulate his uh, saves via magic, uh, but that would only count if they're then also once again affected by magic, because again, if you're a, if he's hit by a missile weapon or a melee weapon, you'll still count as a 3+, plus, which is pretty good. Uh, you also uh, halve the damage, as stated before. Now it's rounding up here, so um, remember that a um, three, uh, 3 damage weapon, for example, would still inflict 2 damage, not 1. Um, and this kind of makes him um, very vulnerable to a mass of one damage attacks, which we'll also get into later, but that's kind of his weakness alongside mortal wounds, because as you can see, there is really nothing here that def that protects him from mortal wounds. There's, he's, he hasn't got a ward save, he hasn't got any uh, mortal wounds damage reduction, so if you're playing against a mortal wound heavy army, especially one that can dish out mortal wounds from afar, like let's say Disciples of Zinch, uh, he will die pretty easily to those attacks. 
His last ability, uh, but definitely not least, is his Supreme Sword Master ability. Once again, it has two effects. Uh, you ignore negative modifiers when making hit rolls for attacks made by this unit. So not positive, though, to be honest, it doesn't really matter because he's only Oh, he's always going to be on that two plus, and hitting on a minus one doesn't on, on a one plus doesn't re really do anything for him. Um, so there's really no reason to add all that attack on him, for example. In addition, if the unmodified hit roll of an attack is six, that attack scores two hits instead of one. Make a wound and save roll for each hit. So this is what we would call exploding attacks or, ex or exploding sixes. Um, it's quite impressive, actually, if you think about his um, Fang Sword having four attacks, and if they would explode, you're you're going from a potential 12 damage to a potential 24 damage from that weapon profile alone. Uh, if you're adding the Selenari Blade on top of on top of that, that is also pretty cool. Okay. Now, uh, for his role in the army, Altharion can do a lot of things, but he's ma mainly a blender. blender. Uh, he can also be a bit of an anvil, but the, the second most important role I feel that like he has, is al alongside his blender role, obviously, is a threat projection. When your opponents are familiar with what he can do, and that's the key word there, can do, they will respond to him in a way that you can abuse. We'll get into that that later, but that is one of my favorite aspects about um, playing Eltharion because he really gets on your opponent's nerves, even if he isn't necessarily that much of a threat, which is kind of funny. But yeah, first of all, he's a blender, of course. Uh, his high rent and damage attacks kind of speak for themselves here. Uh, him ignoring hit modifiers just makes him that more reliable. He also gets his mortal wounds from a shooting attack, um, which makes his ideal target small heroes that he can kill in one go, or anything with a 4 plus save. Obviously you've got the all-out attack to make him 3 plus save, but anything with a 4 plus save will not get a uh, save roll against his attacks. Or at least not against his fang sword, nor his mortal wounds. Honestly, um, We'll look at how to maximize the damage output later on, but if you really want to make the most out of Eltharion damage-wise, really choose your targets carefully. Do not put him up against something with a good ward save, because that is just going to waste his damage output. Um, but do feel free to uh, uh, face him, face let, let him face off against a small hero. Uh, I've actually heard, heard stories where he tackled uh, um, Archaeon, for example, so he can't even tackle big heroes. I really like to place him versus a unit that has uh, high damage and high rent because he, he kind of nullifies or mit, um, decreases the effectiveness of that unit by, simply by being Altharion. Uh, and he usually take, takes care of those uh, pretty good saves that those units usually have as well. So uh, he's a perfect uh, counter to elite units or small heroes, in my eyes at least. Now he's also a bit of an anvil, uh, do be careful though, because he, while he does ignore save modifiers and halves the incoming dam damage, rounding up as we remember, uh, and that is great versus elite attacks, kind of the attacks that I was speaking about earlier, um, he is still very prone to getting sniped from or by uh, horde attacks, either missile or melee, and mortal wounds output, so do be careful, he's not that anvil-y. Uh, he's, he's in stone guard, right? He, uh, he's better defensive wise, but he just doesn't have the volume of wounds and bodies that stone guard have. Okay, so let's look at threat projection here. Um, first of all, chargers or simply even attacks from Altharion are scary. If you're telling your opponent about this guy and you're, you're planning on using him as a threat projection piece, just really f hammer down on that minus, th minus three and three damage side of him, right? So really make your opponent feel what a threat that Altharion can be. And then use him as such. Uh, you can honestly... <laughs> so while he is pretty close to 250 points, you can still allow yourself to use him as a sacrificial pawn if you kind of... Uh, if, if it allows you to... Um, obtain your goals, right? Um, so 
for example, what I mean by threat projection here is I sometimes just place him in the middle of my front lines or behind a small screen, for example, and you'll just notice how different your opponent's going to react. I do this against aggressive armies that are wanting to charge me, for example, uh, because it really puts them off <laughs> from charging you straight on. Um, let's say I, put, I place him behind a unit of Wardens. Um, if, if, if I'm playing against um, the Orcs, for example, they don't want to kill that unit of Wardens and then allow me to make a very easy charge into them. So that is something that you can uh, keep in mind and use to your advantage. You can also use him as a weighted flank, but I'll, I'll save that for a later uh, part of the video uh, because it's much easier to explain with, with some um, visuals. Okay, so let's move on to some basic tactics, and most of them are quite basic actually. Um, so for, normally I actually discuss nations here, but for him especially, because Altharian is such a special boy, uh, we're talking synergy and not nations. So synergy-wise, I gotta say he has very little of it. <laughs> um, he doesn't benefit from any nations, he doesn't benefit from Aether Quartz, and he has no keyword synergy. So he's not a Venari, he's not a Sinari. So all your rules that would interact with those keywords kind of don't affect him at all. So what does this mean for him? Well, it makes him a possible lone agent, not that you would want to play, uh, place him all by himself every time, but you can, uh, because he doesn't need that kind of support at all times. And he, it also makes him a fantastic ally choice, I have to say. If you're watching this and you're not a uh, Lumineth player, maybe you're coming in from a different army and looking for some allies, Eltharion is a fantastic choice. It also means all of his usefulness is completely based on his War Scroll, so it's not connected to any different abilities in the book. Uh, so you can really um, use him to his maximum potential without needing any backup per se. Though backup is... Uh, useful at times, which we'll get into in a second. So uh, I was talking about this uh, frontal threat and weighted flank bit uh, not even a minute ago. Um, so let's look at it from a visual perspective here. So when we're placing or um, positioning Eltharion, at the start of the game, I, you can really go two ways. There's obviously some more ways, but these are the two main ways that I would use him. So as a frontal threat, it is it speaks for itself, I guess. Uh, as usual, this might be my playstyle, but I think it's it's a good playstyle if you're wanting to play a bit competitively at least. Uh, you kind of want to screen your more valuable stuff with minimum sized units. Think small groups of Wardens or even Swordmasters, uh, sorry, Blade Lords, or even Stoneguard really. Uh, here in this um, graph, or in this visual here, um, I used the uh, Warden setup and try to place Eltharion without, uh, outside of the range of too many one damage missile attacks. Why do I say this? Because usually when your opponent is familiar with our castle build or castle style of playing, they will, be, they will uh, easily recognize the threats to their army and Eltharion is often one of those threats. Uh, he's very, very threatening to most armies. And if your opponent realizes that he runs, that he halves damage, ra damage rounding up, he'll probably only be targeted by either mortal wounds or missile attacks with uh, one damage. So really keep him out. Try to keep him outside out, outside of the range of those attacks uh, to keep him safe a little bit at least. Um, once again, I'm not actually sure that in all cases keeping out him outside of that threat range is more important than putting him in front and being threatening yourself because if you're if you're forced to deploy him too far back you're also losing a lot of his potential so uh depending on the rest of your army build here you you kind of have to look at where you're going to place him and whether you want to risk him or not but um if you've placed him um well and uh you've you've got your screens and they die he can just charge easily and retaliate or if they don't die move your screens out of the way a bit like you're making a corridor and just let him pass with this uh, six inch range he's not that threatening but if you add the right buffs on top of that uh, he can be quite of a menace early on as well 
Uh, the last bit is the weighted flank and I kept that in mystery for a little bit here uh, because it is a, uh, a, a tactic I'm very fond of uh, because it is the tactic that was used by Alexander the Great um, back when he was conquering the world um, and it is a tactic that also works in our uh, mini uh, war game here. Um, so Altharion is an excellent piece to um, use this tactic but let me first explain what a weighted flank is in Ascension. Um, or in essence, sorry, essential is not a word probably, uh, in essence. So uh, when we're looking at history, uh, when the uh, when armies were facing off against each other, they were usually uh, formed up in ranks as uh, Lumineth tends to play, especially when you're looking at the uh, Alexander the Great Hoplites, for example, that were, uh, facing, that were facing off in ranks and in um, several ranks of six uh, deep, for example. Um, and they would over enforce one flank so that so that they would be able to push through the enemy and then collapse on his flank and the back because phalanxes obviously are very prone to damage from the rear um, and that kind of play style you can also do with lumineth um, on top of the fact that it just looks amazing <laughs> uh, to do with actual phalanxes in age of sigmar um, Althar altharian is a really good piece for that so Depending on your opponent's army build and mindset, um, they will try to counter Altharion or at least out-deploy you in some way. And if you're dropping Altharion early on and you put him on the sides, your opponent really has to make a decision. Is he going to counter Altharion with something that can tackle him? Either a very strong horde ranged piece or an elite unit that is equal to Altharion or better. Um, or is he going to ignore it completely? Either way, this gives you the chance to uh, reply to or respond to that deployment as well. And you can react to that in a way that has much more um, effectiveness than your opponent usually, be simply because we have so many buff spells that can um, nullify bad deployment, right? Uh, if you're looking at speed of H, transporting vortex, uh, the range of the Sentinels, um, you could really let Altharion uh, be a distraction carnifex for the K term here. Um, let your opponent focus on him, on him, deploy a lot of threats opposite of Altharion, and then focus all of your efforts on the diff on the other flank. Now this does this does take some knowledge of your opponent's army and how he will deploy. Um, but I would advise you to try out this tactic because it's really funny <laughs> uh, to do so. Um, so yeah, there you go. All right, so when we're looking at Altharion, he and I mentioned that he could be a lone agent, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be, and I wouldn't advise it, uh, advise it to play that way, uh, because he does benefit a lot from certain buffs. First of all, our magic obviously is a great addition to his tool set. Um, he only moves six inches and he's a beat stick, so you really want him uh, to be fast, so speed of fish is vital for aggressive play to double his movement and you and when you when you have the chance to put him in a ward bubble please do <laughs> it makes him so much more survivable especially on top of him halving the damage so he's halving normal damage and then still getting a ward save um, versus that damage so that's pretty good and it also circumvents his weakness to mortal wounds, right? So protection of fish or protection from techless is also vital for defensive play and survivability. Transporting Vortex can be cool on Altharion, especially later on in the game when he's done dealing with uh, one of the units on the weighted flank, for example. You pick him up and you drop him anywhere on the battlefield. I like this ability a lot. Uh, I would not advise to use it as a turn one kind of thing. So dropping Altharion outside of nine, just in front of your opponent's front lines as a turn one alpha strike sort of thing is pretty risky. You can still do it, but again, I would do it on a flank somewhere um, rather than completely in the middle of his army because then you will probably lose him. Other buffs that benefit him are the Phoenix Stone. Obviously, he can't take the Phoenix, Phoenix Stone himself, but that's also not the point of the Phoenix Stone. So you want a small hero with a Phoenix Stone nearby, for example, and it can allow you to resurrect Eltharion, which is super lore friendly as well, by the way. Um, 
Does this work often? No. Does it, is this useful for mind games? Definitely. So again, Lumineth is a very mind games heavy army. It really gets under your opponent's skin and the Phoenix Stone is a great artifact for that. So just the threat of focusing all of your attacks on a unit that halves damage and maybe even has a ward save thanks to your magic. And then you possibly being able to resurrect that uh, unit that your opponent's been focusing on with a Phoenix Stone, that really takes all the, <laughs> the joy <laughs> Or, or at least the um, focus out of certain attacks. So just imagine you being your, in your opponent's shoes. Would you risk an entire shooting phase or maybe even a magic phase and a, uh, a hero phase, a uh, shooting phase and a, a combat phase um, on killing a 250 points model and then him possibly getting back up. So that is pretty big. Uh, he's also a prime target for heroic recovery as... Um, <laughs> Best day ever doesn't affect him at all. Uh, his healed wounds sort of count for double the value, sort of, uh, because obviously for each wound that you heal, your opponent has to deal two somewhat uh, two uh, because of him halving damage. Obviously, that's not complete, completely correct because uh, we're rounding up and mortal wounds don't get half, but you know what I mean. And also, always save ACP if you want to charge with him because him getting a charge off is crucial to him doing reliable damage. So forward to victory as a command ability is a massive thing to save for Eltharion especially. Okay, and that leaves us with our last segment here, uh, the tips and tricks. Now, sometimes I have, <laughs> I have some gimmicky tr uh, tricks here uh, for Eltharion because he has so little synergy with the rest of our book. I had a really hard time coming up with special ways that I would use him that I have not already mentioned. So we'll just point out, out some things that you might not know if you're not familiar with Altharion before. Um, so first of all, I kind of I kind of see him as a hero sniper sometimes because his searing darts are not uh, a missile attack. Keep that in mind. So it is a ranged weapon, as in it is used in a shooting phase and it has a long range, but it is not a missile weapon. It is not on his profile. So you can use the searing darts of light as an attack to kill units that were protected from missile attacks. For example, with the new GHB that's coming up, um, season two from 22, 23, uh, that is, um, small heroes will be protected from ranged fire, but not from searing darts because they are not counted as a missile attack. Um, so you could re easily pierce, pierce through that bodyguard rule. Uh, you can also shoot outside, uh, targets outside of your combat, so normally when you're in, in combat with the unit you're only allowed to shoot them, but Altharion can just aim his darts on something outside of them. So this is especially handy again when uh, a small hero is being bodyguarded, uh, either by the bodyguard rule or just by units swarming you and the hero keep, uh, is kept outside of that combat, you can still target that hero with Altharion. Now I do also want to point out, out, as it is not a missile attack, you're not allowed to take an Unleash Hell command ability with Altarion. I call this the Hero Sniper because I use it as such. Um, I use it to soften up, soften up heroes or finish them off, and sometimes I finish them off in just one go. If you roll that 5 or 6 and you deal uh, 5 or 6 mortal wounds, oof, that is painful for your opponent because that is... Um, a very cheap attack that's honestly just a small addition to his tool set um, that you did not expect to be that effective and it's just really nice to uh, to get that so yeah definitely uh, focus on the heroes if you can and especially if they don't have any ward saves let's also talk about his survival a bit more uh, we've already um, touched on this quite a few times before uh, but as i said before avoid hordes especially if they have ward saves for example do not put him up against Phoenix Guard because them uh, they, they have a good save um, and your your uh, <clears throat> your uh, high damage attacks are just going to get um, reduced by their ward saves. And also, if let's say you're fighting zombies, for example, sure he'll probably even do 10, 20, 12, 15, 20 wounds even, which is obviously massive. Uh, but do you really want to waste 250 points? of attacks on a, on a horde unit, so usually I try to avoid that. Um, 
do take this with a grain of salt obviously this suggestion depends completely on your army build if you're running a um an army that has only has elite attacks so for example wardens they have quite some attacks but not that many alfari might actually be a good horde clearer himself so that is something to keep in mind but with us having uh, pretty good profiles on the blade lords now um, i think we have better tools to deal with uh, hordes also be wary of mass one damage attacks again i mentioned this before especially in missile form that is really threatening to him because he has no protection from that whatsoever um especially the cheap ones for uh for example the ones from city of sigmar let's say uh the crossbowmen or the handgunners they have very little to no rend uh they have a ton of attacks they are quite cheap to get as well so if you're getting if you're being targeted by um 60 crossbow attacks with no rent for example you might you're, you're probably going to lose him because, because you're always going to be on a three plus save whereas some other heroes might be on a two plus save and rounding up one damage attacks is still one damage if you're halving them so uh yeah that is quite important to remember also and that's more of a uh, lesson that i had to learn the hard way myself even though he's still quite fragile to mortal wounds and one damage attacks please do also play him boldly when possible it is not worth saving eltharion a 250 point model uh or 240 points as making of this video simply because you want to keep him alive and then sacrificing your entire game plan for it he's there to do what he does if he dies so be it it's only 250 or 240 points um that is not a uh that is not a thing that you can't afford to lose you can still afford to lose it and still win the game so keep that in mind lastly we're moving on to battle tactics so when you're looking at the battle tactics uh, from your ghb you'll see that m usually he is pretty good at completing the aggressive battle tactics uh, think eye for an eye or gaining momentum or whatever it is that's popular when uh, you're watching this guide he's pretty good at killing stuff and not dying himself so he's he'll he'll do that for you uh, there's also two easy tactics that he'll uh, complete from the lrl book so the conserve eight of course ability um, battle tactic um, needs you to uh, destroy you without spending your eight records well that is just the easiest thing for Eltharion because he has no use for Aether Quartz at all. He doesn't sniff that kind of stuff so uh, because he has no nostrils. Uh, so he doesn't use Aether Quartz at all, so it's easy to keep it on him. Uh, for Ignore the Odds, it, it, where you want to kill a unit and still survive, he's also pretty good because he will usually take out a unit if you focus your attention on that unit. And he, he should survive, especially with your uh, Lightning Reactions, that is an easy one to get. I would also say he's usually unaffected by the GHB uh, battle tactics and rules as a whole because he's a named character on um, on foot with a lot of ignore modifier kind of stuff. Um, there is no real GHB so far that has affected Altharion in a, in a big way. He will be pretty good in a uh, hero heavy meta because he can kill small heroes pretty easily. But again, you're also sacrificing points that you would be able to spend on your own small heroes, for example. So it is a pro and a con here. Uh, he will always be valuable uh, to you, but he'll usually also um, not play well with your GHB rules. So keep that in mind. For me personally, that's, a, that's kind of a cool thing here uh, because that makes these guides really a bit more evergreen than other guides because he doesn't really interact with any GHB stuff anyway. And with that, we've reached the end of this video. So uh, guys, I was so happy to do this guide again. I've been so caught up in the several jobs that I'm doing now. I'm doing three jobs at the moment and this felt like a fourth one at, at times because I had so much to do. I've really found joy in, in making this guide again, so I'm looking forward to making uh, new guides for you in the future. Uh, we'll speak, we'll talk list building soon as well, especially with the new JHB coming up. Uh, you can also expect a guide on the JHB for that as well, especially from the Luminous, Lumineth standpoint, as I did with the previous one half a year ago. We'll go over all the missions, the battle tactics, and what it means uh, for us as an army. 
So do leave a like, feel free to share and subscribe. Uh, the sharing and the liking really helps me, me out a lot and keeps me motivated. It also helps um, Ryan and Nick who are work, working on the channel as well. Uh, we love to hear your feedback in the Discord and in the comments. So please uh, do stay in touch there. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.